Hello everybody, my name is Jason Neal and I am the Bald Chemistry Teacher. Today's video is all about gravimetric analysis. Gravimetric analysis. And I'm going to walk you through how to do the lab and what to do with the data, how to do the calculations once you've collected it. So let's go ahead and get started. Now before I get started, just a quick disclaimer, on this video I am not wearing chemical splash goggles. All right, That is not the best idea. I highly, highly, highly recommend wearing chemical splash goggles whenever you're in the lab. Okay, Just wanted to give you that quick disclaimer and let's jump right in. Today we're going to learn about a lab technique known as gravimetric analysis. Now, when you hear the term gravimetric analysis, it sounds kind of scary. It sounds like, what am I getting into? But actually, it's not that challenging. So pay attention, and by the end of this video, I think you'll understand what gravimetric analysis is all about, and you'll be able to use it to solve problems in chemistry. Before we get started, I want to point out something very important about solutions. So here, we've got a, a solution of salt water. It's just regular old salt water. And solution concentration is measured in molarity. That's the moles of salt per liter of solution. Now, if I take the salt water and pour it into a smaller container, the concentration of this salt water is the same as the concentration of this salt water. In other words, if I took a sip of this salt water, which is a bad idea, never drink out of a beaker, but if I did take a sip out of this salt water and out of this one, both would taste equally salty. So the amount that I take, even a smaller beaker, if I have just this much, it would taste just as salty as a small sip of this one. The concentration in this small amount is the same as the concentration in this larger amount of salt water. Well, today, we're going to determine the concentration of a solution. Not a solution of salt water, but a solution of potassium iodide. Potassium iodide here is dissolved in water. And I want to know what the concentration is. How much potassium iodide, how many moles per liter? I'm looking for the molarity of the solution. To do this, I'm going to take just a portion of this solution because after all, a small amount poured out will have the same concentration as this whole big, well, it's not a big beaker, but you know what I mean. All right, so I'm going to take about 9 to 10 milliliters. I'm going to use this graduated cylinder. This is a small graduated cylinder and pretty accurate for volume measurements. Alternatively, you could dispense this out of a burette if you need even greater accuracy. For my purposes, I'll just use this graduated cylinder. And I'm going to put in between 9 and 10 milliliters. All right, and then once you have that, you want to look at it level and I'm gonna call that about 9.45 milliliters. So you can write that down, 9.45 milliliters. Now, molarity is the moles of potassium iodide divided by the liters of solution. So my milliliters, being 9.45 milliliters, divide that by 1,000, and you have 0 0.00945 liters. So, all I need to find molarity is the moles of potassium iodide in here divided by the liters, and I already know the liters, 0 0.00945. So, this problem now becomes find the moles of potassium iodide in this amount of liquid. Once I find the moles of potassium iodide, I will then divide by 0 0.00945, and that will give me the molarity of this, which is equal to the molarity of my solution. 
All right. Well, I need to get a filter paper, and this is my filter paper. I weighed this ahead of time, and the mass of this filter paper, all nice and dry, is 0 0.74 grams. So 0 0.74 grams, I'm gonna need this later. Now, I'm gonna make this filter paper into a funnel. Well, a filter, I guess. You, you fold it in half once, like so, and then fold it in half again. It's kind of a little uh, origami filter. Now, when you look at it, open up a flap so that you have a nice little cone. And that cone looks like this, all right? Uh, be careful when you open up a flap, you, know, you don't want to open it up like this. There should be no gap in it. So you pick a flap, open it up, and now this is a nice filter. It's going to go into our funnel right here. And I'm going to use a distilled water wash bottle to just kind of moisten the filter and it will then kind of stick to the glass all on its own. All right, I think that's good to go. All right, now I'm gonna take my potassium iodide, again, it's about 9.45 milliliters, and I'm gonna add it to a larger beaker here, not too large, but just a little bit. Now, at this point, I need to make sure that I get every last bit of my potassium iodide out of here. And so I'm going to use my wash bottle, distilled water, and I'm going to rinse my graduated cylinder. And I need to do that three times. Rinse the graduated cylinder with distilled water. That's making sure that I get all of my potassium iodide out of here. Now question, how come I can do this? Why can I add distilled water to the mix here? Well, the answer is, by adding distilled water to this, am I changing the moles of potassium iodide? No. I add water, I'm not changing the moles of potassium iodide. Remember, all I need to find is the moles of potassium iodide. Once I find the moles, I will then divide by 0 0.00945 liters and that will give me the molarity, the original molarity, in my original solution. All right, once I've got all of the potassium iodide transferred from the graduated cylinder into this beaker, what I need to do now is I somehow need to figure out how, much, how many moles of potassium iodide are in here. So I'm gonna do that with a solution of lead nitrate. What I did, I dissolved some lead nitrate in water, and I'm gonna add that to potassium iodide. Now, why would I do that? It's because the lead iodine lead in here is going to bond with the iodide in here to make particles of lead iodide. Lead iodide is not soluble. So when I pour the lead nitrate into here, you will see the visible lead iodide particles. And it's kind of a neat reaction. So watch this. That's kind of cool. Now, it turned all yellow. Why is it yellow? Well, the lead ions bonded with the iodide ions and formed yellow particles of lead iodide. Lead iodide is not dissolved anymore. They're very tiny particles that are suspended in the liquid. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour this liquid through my filter. I'm going to rinse my beaker several times because I want to make sure I get all of the lead iodide out of here. So it'll take at least three rinsings, probably more. And then we're going to have to wait. You know, after I, I, I'm going to keep rinsing this, and I have to wait for this to drip through. So what's happening here is my potassium, or I'm sorry, my lead iodide is going to get stuck in the filter, and all the other liquid is going to run through. 
And now it's just kind of a waiting game. It's not fun. So we'll just kind of wait. Okay, while I'm waiting for my filter to drip here, uh, I want to talk about what ions are in solution. This is my potassium iodide beaker. And what ions are in here? Let's ignore the water molecules and focus on just the ions that are in here. It's, there's potassium ions and there's iodide ions, right? Potassium is positive one, iodide is negative one. Then when I add my lead nitrate, lead nitrate is made of lead ions, which are positive two, and nitrate ions, which are minus one. So when I add my lead nitrate to my potassium iodide, I need to add excess. I wanna make sure that I add enough lead to bond with all the iodide. So I have to add extra lead nitrate. So I'm gonna pour a bunch of lead nitrate in there. So I've added extra lead nitrate. Now, what ions are present in the solution? At first, I've got a bunch of lead ions, a bunch of nitrate ions, some potassium ions, and some iodide ions. But then the lead, pretty quick, right? The lead bonds with the iodide and forms the yellow particles. What, what ions are left in the solution? Well, there's still a bunch of nitrate ions. There's still the potassium ions are still in there. And there's probably some extra lead ions that didn't have any more iodide to bond with. Well, we'll let the stuff keep filtering. Looks like I'm almost done. And then we'll be able to carry on with the lab. But it's very important to visualize the ions that are present in solution. All the ions are getting washed through the filter. The only thing sticking there is the yellow lead iodide powder. So, all right, we'll just have to keep, keep watching. All right, welcome back. It's been a little while, but now that my water, my liquid has gone through the filter, what is left in my filter is of course the yellow lead iodide solid, but there's also some other dissolved ions, like the, the water is there, some potassium ions are still there, some nitrate ions. Uh, and so I wanna make sure that I rinse my yellow precipitate. I wanna rinse it with some water so that any ions, like potassium ions, nitrate ions, any extra lead ions, all of the ions get washed through. And all I want in my filter paper is water and my yellow lead iodide precipitate, okay? So I need to rinse my whole filter again, all the yellow stuff, I need to rinse it several times with distilled water, making sure that all of the potassium, the nitrate, extra lead, everything gets rinsed through except my yellow precipitate. So you know what that means? I have to wait even longer for more water to rinse through, but I want a nice clean precipitate. So it is worth the wait. Okay, so I'm just gonna do some rinsing and waiting a little bit, and uh, you guys won't have to endure it, but I will. Wait. Oh, well, after a long wait, uh, it looks like Looks like the water, or at least most of the water, is through the funnel. Whew. Now, the better your filter paper, the longer it takes, you know? Okay, uh, let me show you what we got now. Carefully, I wanna peel the filter paper off of the funnel. Ripping it right now would be really bad. I'd have to like restart this experiment. So, I just hope I don't rip it. And what I'm left with is this wet orange, or nah, yellow, this wet yellow sludge, okay? 
Now to complete this experiment, what I'm going to need to do, so you can kind of see it in there, I'm going to spread it out, open up my filter. Yeah, look at that. Look at that yellow stuff. Okay. Uh, I'm going to open up my filter and just let it sit and dry. It's going to have to sit and dry overnight or in a drying oven. So I'll probably take this yellow sludge and put it in a drying oven and then I need to weigh it. So again, uh, I'll have to be right back with that. I'm going to sit in the oven for several hours, come back later and uh, weigh this dried filter paper and dried yellow powder and see what I come up with. We're back and I've got my dried filter paper with precipitate and I weighed it and it turns out to be about 2.44 grams. Okay, 2.44 grams and that includes the lead iodide and also the filter paper. So remember, I need to subtract out the filter paper from uh, the, when it was empty, right? Just the blank filter paper, it was 0.74 grams. So I'm going to take 2.44 grams, subtract out the 0.74 grams, and so my mass of just the yellow lead iodide turns out to be 1.70 grams. Now, it's time to use that number, 1.70 grams of lead iodide, and we're going to use that to calculate the moles of potassium iodide in our original solution. Remember, our goal here, we're trying to get the moles of potassium iodide and divide by the liters. Remember our liters, 0 0.00945 liters. Okay, so how are we going to get the moles of potassium iodide? The iodide is the key. So I have 1.70 grams of lead iodide. Let's change that into moles of lead iodide, okay? Get the molar mass of PBI2 from the periodic table. Take a lead and two iodides, add that up. It's about 461 grams per mole. Three significant figures, 461, that should be accurate enough. So take that 461 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of lead iodide. Then we take our 1.70 grams, divide by 461. What that's going to give us is the moles of lead iodide. And that's going to be 0 0.00369 moles. 0 0.00369 moles of lead iodide. Now, we need to think about how lead iodide is made. Lead iodide is made from one lead and two iodides. So it takes two iodides and one lead to make one lead iodide. So if we have 0 0.00369 moles of lead iodide, that means we have 0 0.00369 moles of lead, but we needed twice as much eyes, twice as much iodine. So we have 0 0.00369 times two moles of iodide ions, okay? Which is 0 0.00738. All right, let's, let's recap that for a minute. It takes 0 0.00738 moles of iodine and 0 0.00369 moles of lead to make 0 0.00369 moles of lead iodide, okay? Because every mole of lead iodide has one mole of lead and two moles of iodide, okay? So the moles of iodide are always twice as many as the moles of lead iodide. So stop for a minute, make sure that makes sense to you because the moles of iodide is the key here, okay? 0 0.00738 moles of iodide ions. That's how many moles were in my graduated cylinder. 0 0.00738 moles of iodide ions. Well, guess what? That is how many moles of potassium iodide were in here. It's the same because for every mole of iodide, you get one mole of potassium iodide. How do you make a mole of potassium iodide? You need one mole of potassium and you need one mole of iodide. Well, 
if I have 0 0.00738 moles of iodide, I must have had 0 0.00738 moles of iodide, uh, potassium iodide in the first place. So then, how am I going to get my molarity? I take those moles, 0 0.00738 moles, and I divide by my original liters, 0 0.00945. And when I do that, I get my molarity, and my molarity is 0 0.781. 0 0.781. That was my original molarity of my potassium iodide. And that is how you can use gravimetric analysis to find an unknown molarity of a solution. It really hinges on forming a precipitate. We had to form a precipitate, get those iodide ions out there, uh, out of there so that we could weigh them and do a backward calculation and find the moles. So gravimetric analysis, you almost always have to have a precipitate going on, okay? And you use a calculation to get back to your moles, divide by the original liters that you had, and boom, you got the concentration. So hopefully this method of, of gravimetric analysis is understandable now. It's a big word, but not too difficult to do. The water rinsings that I did were very important, and you can't skip those steps, otherwise you'll introduce errors. And you might want to think about what errors would you introduce? What if I didn't rinse the precipitate very well? What kind of error would that introduce? It's a good idea to think about. And uh, well, thanks for watching. Hopefully gravimetric analysis makes a lot of sense now.